Rudolph. And I'm Messenger Charles Minor. I'm Pat Shelton, and welcome to Real to Real. On a night that is soon to be the ghosts and goblins of All Hallows' Eve and closely followed on by All Saints' Day, which when you went to Catholic school was great because you had the next day oh, off wow. from Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful thing about All Saints' Day now is a little parade that children in first and second grade and kindergarten make, a parade, of, a parade of saints. And have you seen one of them? No, I haven't. They're really worthwhile seeing. If you ever get a chance to go out and see one, go. Mm -hmm. I know it's unusual, bad time of day, but little kids all dressed up like their patron saints. We have, a, we have a wonderful parade at our parish, the Parade of the Great Pumpkin. Uh-oh. And everybody dresses up, and we just go around the blocks, and it's great fun. It's a fun <laughs> time of year, it I is. can't imagine my being dressed up like a pumpkin, though. St. Charles may be a pumpkin. No, no. he's not a pumpkin, <laughs> no. <laughs> I would think, though, we have to really capture the idea of saints and sanctity. And we have a piece to show you tonight on Misericordia, the Heart of Mercy. Wait till you see the Sanctity and Mercy Village. Halloween is a night when you can change into someone different, and if you'd like to change into someone more loving, listen to Lenny Donahue. And my special guest will tell us about a service that offers a, a low, will tell us about a service that offers a positive choice to low-income women. When we listen to the words of St. Paul, he tells us that we need to know the power of faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Grace of these is love, and I think the expression of mercy is what we have to understand. Mercy is not just being pitiable. The pity is part of it, but the whole sense of mercy is a service that we can give in love to one another. And when you see Mercy Village, you'll understand that faith and love are the forces that make mercy really work in Mercy Village. It's 7 a.m. in this one-block residential community, nestled on a quiet corner in the north side of Chicago. Like many other suburban neighborhoods, the residents inside these homes are just beginning their day. But the families here are not what you would expect to find in your average American neighborhood. Morning, PJ. Good morning. How are you doing today? Doing good. How about you? good. Everything is wonderful. The eight men who live in this household are all mentally disabled. This residence is only one of nine homes which comprise a unique community known as the Heart of Mercy Village. Here, mentally disabled young adults are given an uncommon opportunity for personal growth. Within the Heart of Mercy Village, they can live their entire lives in the comfort and dignity of a non-institutional, family-like setting. Each household is supervised through the care of two people who are part of a dedicated staff working within this special program. In this home, Ed and Beth Brennan are the live-in house coordinators for these young adult residents. Coming here and moving in on eight men that had been settled and with other people was a very difficult thing for me. We had never lived with special needs people in our lives and then all of a sudden to be here for 24 hours a day was a very difficult thing. I think probably our love for each other and our faith and our really commitment to try with these men has what's made it for us. One of the difficult things about being in a position like this is that you're, we're called residential coordinators, but you're like a house parent and you have eight sons suddenly, uh, somewhat young in their, uh, mentality to some extent others you know some are higher functioning than others but but it's like having eight sons who very often are looking for your approval wanting your attention sometimes there may be some who are upset or irritated and you're not sure exactly how to respond to them at the particular moment and uh, we just kind of take one day at a time with these men and they probably are taking one day at a time with us too as we move along in our lives together the Heart of Mercy Village was established in 1983 by the Sisters of Mercy, who have been active for more than 60 years in the care of mentally and physically challenged individuals. The village is only part of a total care concept called Misericordia, a name which means Heart of Mercy. The Misericordia facilities provide living quarters and vocational instruction for over 350 special needs people. The Heart of Mercy Village was created as an innovative program for more capable mentally disabled individuals. Heart of Mercy Village 
is unique in the sense that uh, people not only share life with people with mental and physical disabilities, but they come and live life with these very special people. And they come recognizing how gifted the people with mental and physical disabilities can be. They're willing to share family life. They're willing to share community life. They want to share their gifts and be open to the gifts of the disabled persons. And it's a very enriching experience for all who are involved. Residents at the heart of Mercy Village learn to develop in a real-life community environment. Weekday masses like this one not only help to strengthen their sense of community, but also serve as an expression of the spiritual foundation of all who live and work in the village. Prayer for uh, the men and women here at Misericordia is uh, an integral part of their life. I think it's an important part for them. They would miss it if it were not something that they were able to go to daily with one another. They seem to have an incredible faith. I, I think that they probably have a relationship with, with Christ that would surpass most people's. Daily life at the heart of Mercy Village is designed to instill a sense of pride and dignity in every one of these special needs individuals. By providing job opportunities for all adult residents, the village program works to develop the self-esteem of all employed members within its community. We think that um, working is a very important expression of the total person, and that's part of the daily life of the young people living in the village. So the people are moderately disabled who are living in the village. They must be able, with help, to sustain themselves in the life-giving skills. They must be able to share community and to be gift givers in that environment. Many of the residents are employed within the Misericordia Arts and Crafts Center. Here they develop and use their creative skills to produce a wide range of marketable items which are sold within Misericordia's unique gift shop. We have a gift shop that will appeal to a wide variety of people. We just use their own creativity to help develop new ideas. They, they come on with new creative ideas. Our teachers might suggest something that they do, but their, their way of producing, their way of drawing, is so spontaneous and that's so sure in the line of creativity that we want that they have taught us a lot of the spontaneity of what creativity is all about because they draw from their hearts. They draw things so much more vibrant than I think any of us could ever do. In addition to developing the residents' work skills, family interaction remains a key element in the success of the Heart of Mercy Village program. For village households like Ed and Beth's, there is a time for play, a time for group prayer, a schedule for regular chores, and even a homemade family dinner. Within the security of this warm environment, many times the relationships between the residents and house coordinators evolve into a deep, positive attachment for one another. The guys here have been calling me mom, nanny, grandmother, <laughs> friend. Um, my relationship with them grows every day. I find it's a different relationship with to each one of them. Two of our men have lost their mothers, and it's kind of a thrill for me when one of uh, them really calls me mother. And I took one of the men out for a drive last night because he was a little bit of a problem for staff that had come in. And I was talking to him, and um, I said to him, I said, you know how much I love you. And he said, yes, I do know that. You're a great mom. The love given by house coordinators like Ed and Beth makes the heart of Mercy Village a true home for all its residents. I would say uh, I relate with them as, uh, as a father, as a friend, as a, maybe a teacher. I, I guess that th those would be the words that I would think of uh, in terms of my relationship with these men. Okay. Good night, Mark. Good night. Have a good night's rest. Okay. See you tomorrow. God bless you. And God bless you. Thanks. Okay. All right, pal. All right.
And when you and I say, God bless you too to each other, it means we have faith and love for each other. We'd love to have you tonight on Real to Real because there's much more to come. My special guest now is Mrs. Faye Cheeseman, clinical director of the Maternity and Adoption Services, part of the Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Trenton. Welcome, Faye. Thank you. Now, Faye, you are here to tell us about a special medical fund uh, available for pregnant women in the Diocese of Trenton. It's very special, and would you please tell us about it? We discovered, Pat, uh, three or four years ago that there were a number of women in need of medical care relative to their pregnancies who were falling in between the cracks. That is, they were not eligible for any private insurance nor for any public insurance. Uh, these women found themselves faced with three choices. With an unplanned pregnancy and $2,500 perhaps in medical bills ahead of them, it was difficult for them to think about keeping their baby, about parenting their baby, even about placing their baby for adoption. While it became increasingly easy for them to think about adoption, I'm sorry about abortion, because abortion could be attained for $300 as opposed to the expense, extensive costs of, of medical bills. Mm -hmm. Would you give us a profile of the type of woman we're talking about? Which kind of women fall through the cracks? Traditionally, she's a high school graduate who's been out of school maybe six or seven months, and uh, she lives at home with her family. Um, uh, her mother works in a supermarket, and her father is, is a laborer somewhere, and she has a job at the 7-Eleven, and she works full time. But at 7-Eleven, you work for minimum wage, and so you don't get any fringe benefits. So she has no hospitalization of any kind and gets caught in the cracks because her income prohibits her from uh, eligibility for Medicaid funds. And uh, her parents' medical coverage probably would not provide That's for right. teenage her parents. pregnancy? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, can, is there another type of woman, uh, or the older type woman who might be in this category also? Oh, the 40-year-old woman who is uh, is in the process of divorcing her husband often finds herself pregnant, again, with, with an unplanned pregnancy. And she, too, has a special set of circumstances that prevent her, the same as the 15-year-old who is living at home with her parents, but whose parents' hospitalization does not provide coverage mm -hmm. for so the minor bottom, children. the bottom line here is these women faced with these expenses may turn to abortion rather than bringing the baby to term and then having the option of keeping it or placing it for adoption. That's right. And the basic purpose of the medical fund was to pay medical bills for these women so that they could indeed choose the gift of life for their baby mm -hmm. as opposed to having to have an abortion. Now, I understand in the Diocese of Trenton there's going to be a special collection to help fund this this medical, uh, these medical expenses. The, when is this, Faye? Um, at every Mass in every parish in the diocese on November 4th and 5th. Mm -hmm. 
there we hope will be a special collection that will be exclusively for this medical fund. Okay, and I'm sure that would be um, of great interest to all of the people who are anti-abortion. Um, November 4th and 5th at every Mass, a That's second right. collection to help uh, fund, um, pay the expenses of these unfortunate young women. Okay, very good. Um, And the Diocese of Trenton is about 180 churches? 120. About 120 yes, churches? Yes. So there are 120 par uh, parishes, and there are 200,000 families. Uh, if, if every family in the diocese would give $1 a year, oh. we'd, we'd be in wonderful condition. But well, I certainly uh, hope that is the situation. Uh, let us all be charitable and uh, thoughtful on the 4th and 5th of November and help these young ladies and help Faye do her job <laughs> with Catholic Charities. Faye Cheeseman, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You know, the other week we had a segment on relationships for men who have difficulty in their relationships. This week we have a segment dedicated to women who have problems in communicating love. In my practice I see a number of women who want to love and be loved. These women are intrinsically lovable, but because they are unable to love themselves, they are, have difficulty communicating love to the people they care most about in this world. Typically, these women grew up in dysfunctional families where alcohol addiction or physical, emotional, or sexual abuse have been present. What they don't realize is the price you pay for growing up in a dysfunctional family is alienation from your true self. This happens because if you felt unloved during a crucial period of your life, almost always childhood, you grow up unable to love yourself. Secondly, if you never felt safe or treasured in your family of origin, the child within you becomes profoundly wounded and it is the child within that needs to be healed. Some of the ways in which this pain manifests itself in the lives of women who have difficulty communicating love include a pervasive depression, underlying sadness, a need to control, guilt, anxiety, unnamed fears, an inability to trust, feelings of hopelessness. In addition, many of these women have poor relationships with their own mothers, their daughters, their sisters, and frequently have few close women friends. Sometimes in an attempt to fill up the painful holes in their own hearts, these women will unwittingly develop addictions of their own to alcohol, to drugs, or other compulsive behaviors such as overeating, perfectionism, excessive religiosity. If you are a woman who has difficulty communicating love, there are things you can do about it. Someone once said, most of us grow up looking a little bit like pieces of Swiss cheese with varying numbers of holes in us. Often we look to other people to fill up our holes. The truth is, while others can help, we need to do the hard work of becoming whole, for we have to face the pain that has brought us to where we are today. Many of my clients are women of great faith who often ask me with pain and sadness in their voices why God has not heard their prayer. And I tell them the story that I once heard the Jesuit Anthony de Mello tell about the man who goes to see his Sufi master and leaves his camel outside untied. And he says to the Sufi master, Master, see what great faith I have in God. I left my camel outside untied, for I know God will take care of it. And the Sufi master looks at him and says, Fool, go out and tie up your camel. God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. One of the things you can do for yourself is get into individual therapy so that you can begin to look at your family of origin issues and begin to resolve them. And find out from your therapist where there would be an appropriate support group for you to attend. Finally, I'd like to leave you with the words of the great Russian writer Dostoevsky, who once wrote and it still continues to be true today. A new way of life has to be paid dearly for and is only acquired with much patience and great effort. 
Well, if action is a good way to get rid of depression, at least Lenny Tonight gives you the steps to take action. And we have a lot more action coming for you, especially in the idea of groups. Please stand by. Twenty years ago, leukemia and related diseases took the lives of enough people to fill a ballpark. But today, more people are surviving, thanks to research by the Leukemia Society of America. Hi, I'm Gary Carter. Join the team that's striking out leukemia. The Leukemia Society of America. We're closing in on a killer. We welcome your comments and suggestions and encourage you to write to us at Real for Real. 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, PA 19103. Or call us during regular business hours between midnight and 6 in the morning. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> we are certainly our own best, worst critics. Uh, we can move ourselves in or out of situations always, never, never for me. We should be kinder to ourselves and stop groping around. And that's why I like to talk about groping and grouping. Jane. Groping and grouping. Well, we're going to go out on a limb tonight and group together two unlikely people together, a homeless woman and Father Bob Curtis, the elegant gentleman that I'm sure you'll remember from Real to Real. And what do these two people have in common? Well, they found out that even in times of trouble, no man is an island. This is a lovely senior residence home. A lady by the name of Betty Garrity lives here. But just a few months ago, the only home that Betty Garrity had were the streets of this city. Some nights it was so cold. I thought I'd freeze to death at night. When I think of those days, in my prayers every night, I thank God. And that's every night for what he has given me. Betty today has a normal, full life, but for six years, she was homeless and desperate. And then one day, she heard that this senior center provided free food. A woman walked in that was obviously a bag lady. And um, her clothes were ragged, her hair was dirty, her hands were dirty. Uh, she just had rubber bands holding on to her feet, some kind of sock or whatever. And she looked hungry, and she was hungry. The center rallied behind Betty, provided food and warm clothing, and got her on Social Security. Their big achievement was securing a HUD-sponsored apartment that Betty could afford. I can hold my head up, and it feels so good to talk to people on equal level. Uh, no longer a bag lady. No longer a bag lady. There's uh, a big difference in Betty today and Betty yesterday. <laughs> and I think that um, we're very proud of her now. Whenever you hear that people don't care anymore, remember the story of Betty Garrity and the people at the Senior Center who did care. Jesus was a group former. He formed groups. The main group Jesus formed is still forming. This is not an ordinary group. It's exclusive. It's exclusive only because it's so inclusive. It includes everybody who wants to be included. Also, this group Jesus formed is not a casual thing. It's not like a sorority or a fraternity. We really need this group. We're all groping in the dark for the meaning of God, for the meaning of ourselves, for who God is, for who we are. And in this groping, there is grouping. Our searching brings us together and assures us that we are never really alone. 
When we forget that, we can become lost. We can become lost like fiery particles flung off from the solar system to be quenched and lost in the black void of space. It can feel like that. The good news we preach is that no one is lost, not ever. And in our group, no one is an outsider, not ever. The Eucharist is our meeting place. It's a place we get together. And everyone belongs there. The Mass is something like a potluck supper. Every person is welcome, but every person must bring something. What you bring is your individuality, your full potential, your whole history, your very self. The good, the bad, the ugly, bring it all. There is never anything within you that cannot be transformed by the Lord. And if ever you doubt this, trust these words of Jesus spoken to the Samaritan woman. He said, if only you recognize God's gift, and who it is that's asking you for a drink, you will ask him instead, and he will give you living water that shall become a fountain within you, leaping up to provide eternal life. All you have to do is recognize Jesus Christ for who he is, and then love him, and let him love you back. And when that happens, you are on the inside of the circle. As Robert Frost wrote in what was his favorite poem, believe it or not, we all run round in rings and suppose while the circle sits in the middle and knows. If the time ever comes in your life when you feel like an outsider, you've closed a door you didn't have to close. So just open the door and come inside. Come inside when you're ready. We're out of time, so we'll see you next week. And all saints be with you. God bless you. Goodbye for now. Travel arrangements for Real to Real by Atkinson and Mullen, Newtown Square, PA, 215-359-5980. We use these 30 seconds to talk to you about our young adult prayer group. That is because we would like every young adult, single or married, 18 to 35, to come and experience the power of God. We meet this coming Saturday and every fourth Saturday of the month at Waldron Mercy Academy. If you're totally new, we have talks for you to understand the renewal. Don't worry about not feeling at home. Very quickly, you'll become part of the group. So come on out this Saturday at 7 p.m. to Waldron Mercy Academy. When you come, say you saw us on Real to Real.